Last week, I heard a very interesting interview with Demis Hassabis from DeepMind, one of the two who recently won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He said he believes that AI is going to eat up many of the use cases for quantum computing. If he's right, that's really, really bad news for quantum computing startups. Let's have a look. But interestingly, I also have a slightly controversial take, which is, uh, and I've, I've talked to some of the world's top com quantum computer, uh, computer scientists on this, is that actually I believe that classical Turing machines, classical computers, uh, are capable of a lot more than we previously thought. Because normally you talk about needing quantum computers to model, uh, to model any kind of classical system, but it may be that classical systems can model quantum systems. And I've tested this out with some of the, you know, people like Professor Zeilinger, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics recently for his pioneering quantum computing work. And, you know, he thought it was very interesting. And David Deutsch, also one of my uh, scientific heroes who's basically invented quantum computing, said it was crazy, <laughs> but the right sort of crazy, which coming from him, I take as a, as, a, as a compliment and as also a sign to maybe pursue it further. That artificial intelligence is a serious competitor for quantum computing isn't new, and a lot of people in quantum computing worry about it for good reason. The issue is in the exact way that quantum computers are better than conventional classical computers. It's not that they are per se faster, but that the algorithms scale better on quantum computers. You see, the quantum advantage comes from a curious property of quantum mechanics, which is that the space of possibilities is much larger than that you'd have without quantum properties like entanglement. If you use these many possibilities to encode your problem and work on it, then some problems are solvable with fewer operations. So that's the advantage, fewer operations. What this means is that when problems become larger, a quantum computer doesn't slow down as much as a conventional computer. But this doesn't necessarily mean the calculation is faster per se, because the operations on a quantum computer are usually much slower than they are on conventional computers. Supercomputer clusters now work in the exa flop range. That's 10 to the 18 operations per second. A quantum computer like Google Sycamore in the best case would manage something like 10 million operations per second if it remained coherent for that long, which it doesn't. This figure summarizes the situation. Quantum computers have an advantage for some problems because they don't slow down as much with the size of the problem. But they have a huge starting disadvantage because they're so slow. They should catch up eventually, but just exactly when depends on how much conventional computers and the algorithms on them improve. And that returns us to Hassebis' remark. I believe what he's getting at is that you might not actually need this entire space of possibilities. So the advantage for quantum computers might be much smaller than expected. Because that's exactly what happened with AlphaFold, the AI system that cracked protein folding, and also previously with AlphaGo, the AI system that learned to play Go. In both cases, the space of possibilities is too large for a computer to brute force its way through by just trying everything out. For example, even if you take a fairly small molecule with about 100 amino acids, there are easily more than 10 to the 40 ways to fold it. So why did AlphaFold work anyway? It's because there are physical rules in the folding, so you don't need the entire space of possibilities. And the software learned these rules from the data. It's a similar thing for Go. There were rules to discover that vastly reduced the space of possibilities. And the same thing is already happening in quantum computing in one of the areas that's attracted the most interest to quantum chemistry. For this, one wants to calculate the properties of molecules or materials without having to produce them. If you can do that, it becomes dramatically easier, faster and cheaper to find substances with design properties for, say, drug development or battery technologies or catalysts that speed up certain chemical reactions and so on. It's commercially very interesting 
And quantum computers are believed to be useful here because ultimately chemistry is all quantum physics. It's about electron bands and how they wrap around nuclei. But maybe you don't need a quantum computer to get the job done. Maybe a well-trained neural network with some physical rules will do. Indeed, just last month, a paper appeared in Science documenting how AI is filling in exactly this niche very quickly. The reason is, loosely speaking, that a lot of molecules and materials are quantum, but not a lot so. You just don't need all these possibilities that a quantum computer offers. Technology Review interviewed Giuseppe Carlio, a professor of computational physics in Switzerland and one of the authors of the science paper. According to Carlio, quantum computers are unlikely to provide any advantage for most problems in chemistry and material science. This is what I believe Hassabis was talking about, that there are certain natural systems, including some of the best use cases for quantum computers, for which there are physical rules that will make the problem digestible for a clever AI. That said, a more speculative interpretation might be that this isn't just the case for certain natural systems, but actually for all natural systems, including quantum computers themselves, once they get large enough, that they don't actually use the entire space of possibilities, but they are more strongly determined by some currently unknown physical rules than we think they are. You can see why I think that's interesting. If that was true, even just approximately or in some cases, that would teach us something very deep about quantum mechanics, though I'm not sure what. And if AI is good at making quantum computers superfluous, we might never find out. In any case, let me tell you something. When Hassabis said this, I was like, oh yes, why haven't I thought of this? Well, that's why he's won a Nobel Prize and I haven't. On the other hand, I'm on YouTube and he isn't, so don't forget to subscribe. To me, science is more than a profession. It's a way to understand the world and to solve problems. This is why I'm happy to work together with Brilliant, whose mission is to help you learn science in the easiest and most engaging way possible. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. I found it to be very effective to learn something new. It really gives you a feeling for what's going on and helps you build general problem-solving skills. They cover a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses on differential equations or large language models. And they're adding new courses each month. It's a fast and easy way to learn, and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with their course on quantum computing or differential equations. And of course, I have a special offer for users of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabina, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days. And you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.